In broad daylight, in front of hundreds of witnesses, a president is murdered. An act of horrific violence. Oh my God, is he really dead? I mean, who did this? Within hours, a suspect is arrested, Lee Harvey Oswald. But two days later, he himself was killed. Came out of nowhere. That was really the origin of a lot of conspiracy thinking. Somebody's trying to silence him. Since that time, millions of Americans have been convinced that the assassination was not the work of one man, but a conspiracy. Can modern forensic science and ballistics crack the case? Oh, good, we got a good trace. For the first time, using state-of-the-art technology, I'm interested in the distance from the knoll to say the headshot. Nova brings together a team of experts to analyze the gun, the bullets, the crime scene, two shooters in the plaza, and the medical evidence. Physical evidence doesn't lie. Cold Case JFK, right now on Nova. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. David H. Koch Fund for Science. Supporting NOVA and promoting public understanding of science. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Additional funding from Roger and Vicki Sand. In the New Mexico desert, firearms experts tackle an old case that has never really gone cold. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. In 1964, one investigation found there was no conspiracy. Fifteen years later, a second investigation said there was. John, you ready? Now, Nova asks, could more sophisticated forensic science provide new insights and uncover the truth about JFK's murder? I gotta go around this table. And come These back men and believe it can. For two years, they've been working to reconstruct the Kennedy shooting. They're convinced that ballistics is the key to cracking the case. 59.5. The JFK case is the classic shooting reconstruction case. 55. It's probably the most historic case in the last century. Luke Haig has been a forensic scientist for 47 years. His specialty is firearms. 50, 50 yards. Working with Luke Haig is another experienced ballistics expert, who also happens to be Luke's son, Mike Haig. Let's go ahead and do one of the vertical angle shots. We've got a nice area of the barrel right here that's cylindrical. My dad is in this business, and I grew up even in grade school going out and helping him with casework and research involving firearms. Mike Haig is an investigator with the Albuquerque Police Crime Lab. He also teaches shooting reconstruction all over the world. Let's do a handgun shot as well. This part of the class, we're looking at multiple different calibers and types of bullets going into cars. The Kennedy assassination is, unfortunately, not as easy in a way. It might seem that reconstructing the Kennedy shooting, which happened in broad daylight, should be simple. There were hundreds of spectators there, some 30 people taking photographs, over 50 law enforcement people in Dealey Plaza. You would think it would be the easiest case in the world to solve. Among the witnesses is a dress manufacturer with an 8mm movie camera, Abraham Zapruder. He shoots 26 seconds that have become the most studied home movie in history. He keeps the limousine right in frame through the whole thing. As shots are fired, bullets are flying, people are hitting the ground all around him, doesn't phase him. Ultimately, the film becomes the crucial piece of visual evidence in the assassination investigation. Yet despite all the evidence and witnesses, the JFK case continues to fuel speculation and debate. The Kennedy assassination is a lot like a Rorschach test. 
If you look at the evidence, the test, and you give me a statement about the assassination, it really tells me more about you than it does about what happened. Everything about the assassination which points to Lee Harvey Oswald, I can share with you an alternative explanation which speaks to the possibility of a conspiracy. The controversies that swirl and develop, I think there's over a thousand books and articles. Not a single one of them, to my knowledge, is written by someone who deals with shooting and shooting reconstructions. So now, Luke and Mike Haig are focusing on the gun, bullets, and crime scene to try and reconstruct one of the most notorious crimes of the 20th century. It happened in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, a Friday. Remember where I was? I was with my future wife coming out of a music class. Typing class. A fellow who was on staff at the high school came in and said, they've shot Kennedy. I was in kindergarten, and I remember um, my teacher burst into the room crying. A woman ran out of the record store near the corner and said, the president's been shot. I didn't believe it. I was with Bobby Kennedy the day of the assassination in a meeting, and we broke for lunch. I was at Love Field. And my, I immediately, after I got to the city desk, I, I called home to talk to my wife. And I said to her, let's get out of this place. I was on the left running board of the follow-up car, immediately behind the president, you'll be a president's car is now turning off to Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the All of a sudden, I heard an explosive noise over my right shoulder. And I saw the president grabbed at his throat, and I knew something was wrong. I jumped off the running board of the follow-up car and ran toward the presidential vehicle. As I was running, they tell me there was another shot. I didn't hear it. Just as I was approaching the president's car, there was a third shot. It hit the president in the head, and then it exploded out the right side of his head. Blood and brain matter and bone fragments sprayed out across the people in the car, across the trunk, myself uh, and uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Pulled myself up in the rear of the car, and Mrs. Kennedy came out in the trunk. She didn't even know I was there. She wasn't reaching for me. She was reaching for something that came off the president's head. I grabbed her and I put her in the back seat, and I screamed to the driver to get us to a hospital. At 80 miles an hour, with Clint Hill sprawled across the trunk, they head for Parkland Hospital. The president's head was in Mrs. Kennedy's lap. She wouldn't let go. She didn't want anybody to see the condition he was in because it was horrible. And so I took off my suit coat. I covered up his head and his upper back. And when I did that, she let go. And we rushed him into the emergency room. The Dallas doctors tried to save him, but it was a hopeless case. There was uh, simply no possibility. He'd lost too much brain matter. Texas Governor John Connolly is also wounded. He will recover. Back at the crime scene, witnesses point to the Texas School Book Depository. As police search the building, a TV news cameraman shoots this footage. Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney, within about 45 minutes of the shooting, discovered uh, three empty rifle cartridges. The fired cartridge cases can be tested and linked to a specific gun. The cartridge case holds the bullet, gunpowder, and a primer. When the firing pin strikes the primer, it creates a spark igniting the powder, which accelerates the bullet through the barrel. After the bullet leaves, the empty cartridge case is ejected from the gun, so the next cartridge can be loaded. The process of loading, firing, and ejecting marks the cartridge case with tiny scratches and gouges that can be seen under a microscope. Markings similar to these can prove the three empty cartridge cases were fired by a rifle also found on the sixth floor. It was only about 10 minutes later that the rifle location was found, a Manlicher Carcano wedged between uh, two stacks of boxes. The Manlicher Carcano, or Carcano, is an Italian rifle made during World War II. The serial number shows this gun was ordered through the mail from Klein's Sporting Goods in Chicago by A. Hiddell. 
an alias used by Lee Harvey Oswald. The Carcano is a military rifle, something that might be popular with gun collectors, but is almost never seen by homicide detectives. In the United States, shootings then, shootings now, don't involve military, high-velocity rifles with hard military bullets. Robert Frazier, the FBI examiner, in his testimony said he'd never seen a 6.5 Carcano. They had no ammunition for this kind of gun in their reference collection. This is the FBI. Might this highly unusual rifle have characteristics that can shed light on the Kennedy case? Luke and Mike Haig acquire one of these rifles for testing. This is a 6.5 millimeter Carcano. That was the proper pronunciation, although most Americans say Carcano. It's a mechanically operated bolt action rifle. It has an offset, inexpensive telescopic sight. It's clear that for anyone planning an assassination, the Klein's ad offered far better guns. A rifle with a much easier lever action. An American military gun that could shoot eight bullets without stopping. And a small, lightweight carbine that could fire 30 rounds as fast as the shooter could pull the trigger. By comparison, the bolt-action Carcano is slow and clumsy. So why would any assassin choose the Carcano? It's a matter of price. This was basically a little less than $13 for the rifle and a little more than $7 for the scope. And as far as the awkwardness of it, uh, practice. As they test the Carcano, Luke Haig discovers the bullet may be even more unusual than the rifle itself. So how did you feel about where the crosshairs were? Unlike civilian bullets, it's made with a full metal jacket, a hard copper shell that surrounds a soft lead core. Here are four typical military bullets from the First and Second World War. They're all full metal jacketed bullets. They're also pointed. The Carcano is basically a cylinder. The cylindrical shape, with straight sides and no taper or sharp point, affects how the bullet interacts with the rifling, spiral ridges in the wall of the barrel that spin the bullet for stability. Pointed bullets have much less surface area contacting the barrel, so they tend to be less stable as they exit the gun. They're only gripped by the gun barrel back at the very end of the bullet. This allows the rest of the bullet to do just a little bit of wiggle as it's going up the barrel and as it emerges from the barrel. The Carcano bullet, the rifling begins grabbing it clear up here at the nose. That's, that's uncommon. I've never seen any other, even other 6.5 rifles that do this. In 1963, little was known about the Carcano rifle and its unique ammunition. But within hours of Kennedy's death, Dallas police have arrested the man who owns it. Lee Harvey Oswald. As reporters swarm in, Dallas homicide cops keep working the biggest case of their lives. They had recovered the firearm, the cartridge cases, Oswald's fingerprints. They had the case sewed up in an excellent way within two days of the incident. I give them high marks. Physical evidence is the main thing that we are relying upon. I figure we have sufficient evidence to convict him. The key evidence, essentially all of it, would have been admissible at trial. Police are also learning more about Lee Harvey Oswald, an ex-Marine with a security clearance. He's a communist who lived more than two years in the Soviet Union, raising the terrifying question of Russian involvement. Was he put up to this by the Russians? As a nation, we would have to take retribution. We would have to fire back if they killed our president. Sunday morning, less than 48 hours since Kennedy's death, Dallas police start transferring Oswald to county jail. He's been shot. He's been shot. Hey, Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot. On live television, Oswald is shot and killed by Jack Ruby, 
a strip club owner with a long arrest record. An assassination that came out of nowhere, that had no explanation, now gets weirder and weirder. Now there will be no trial, no answers to the questions. Did Oswald kill Kennedy? Did he have help? Did Jack Ruby silence him as part of a conspiracy? Pollsters go into the field and within a week, 60% of respondents are saying more than one person was responsible. There is no question that Ruby killing Oswald raised big time the possibility of a conspiracy. Policymakers were very, very sensitive to talk about a communist conspiracy because it had very important and very dangerous foreign policy implications. Five days later, now President Lyndon Johnson announces that a commission headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren will investigate. We're looking back at it now as if all they had to do was just do fact-finding. It's not true. The need that led to the Warren Commission was not to find out what happened, but to assure the American people what didn't happen. The Warren Commission will spend 10 months investigating, but before they even start, some of the most critical evidence in the crime of the century has been lost forever. The problem begins at Parkland Hospital when John Kennedy is pronounced dead. Dr. Earl Rose, Dallas County medical examiner, is required by law to perform an autopsy. Well, that was not what we wanted to hear. We were going to take the president's body back to Washington. It doesn't exactly come to blows, but there's almost the implicit threat that the Secret Service people will pull their guns if they have to. In the end, they accepted the fact that that's what was going to happen and did happen. They take the body to Air Force One. We, the agents who uh, brought the president there to Dallas, alive, vital, energetic, and now we're carrying his body in a casket in the presence of his now widow. It was very traumatic, quite emotional. Those Secret Service guys were just beside themselves, you know, trying their best to be cool and calm and professional to lose a president, good God. There's nothing worse for a Secret Service agent. Then, when it seems like nothing else could go wrong for the Secret Service agents, something does. With the handles on, the casket was too wide to go through the doorway. As Jacqueline Kennedy waits, they break off the handles. Returning to Washington, again, the subject of an autopsy is raised. In a bullet murder, there is no area of evidence more important than the autopsy. You can infer the trajectory of the bullets. So the autopsy in the Kennedy assassination is absolutely critical. But the autopsy decision is made by the wrong people for the wrong reasons. The whole Kennedy entourage does not understand the distinction between just an autopsy and a forensic autopsy. Kennedy uh, was a Navy man, so the autopsy is going to be done at Bethesda Naval Hospital. A couple of ordinary hospital pathologists are assigned to do the autopsy. Meanwhile, nobody asks whether James Humes and J. Thornton Boswell the two hospital pathologists are in any way qualified to do this autopsy. They weren't. These people were not forensic pathologists. They knew they weren't forensic pathologists, but they were military people. They were ordered to do the autopsy, so they had to do it. Friday evening, Kennedy's autopsy begins. They start with x-rays, which reveal bullet fragments in the brain. It's also clear that Kennedy had a tracheotomy in the ER to insert a breathing tube. But the pathologists don't realize there's a wound there as well. They did not know uh, that the tracheostomy, which they saw, had obscured a wound in the throat. Then they find a bullet hole in his back, which quickly becomes a problem. 
They had what was clearly an entrance wound in the back, and they couldn't account for the bullet. The doctors are in a quandary because they got a bullet hole in Kennedy's back. They do total body x-rays. There's no bullet in the body. So if a bullet hit Kennedy in the back, where did it go? But the doctors aren't shown crucial evidence that would reveal where the bullet went. The clothing had been taken away by the police. Well, examination of the clothing is part of the autopsy. It's very important to know. Kennedy's shirt collar and tie show a bullet exited his throat, but doctors don't know that. Then they learn a bullet has been found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. So doctors assume it worked its way out of the body during cardiac massage. With that, they conclude the autopsy and the body is taken to lie in state. Now the doctors must write their report without access to the body, x-rays, or photos. This is crazy. I mean, these guys saw the wound. Why can't they see the photos? And they saw the x-rays only once. After speaking with the Dallas ER doctors, they conclude Kennedy was hit by two shots fired from behind and above. One went through his neck, the other shattered his skull. So the bottom line is Kennedy did not have the kind of autopsy he should have had. Because proper measurements and documentation were not done, the Kennedy autopsy will fuel controversy and debate for decades. But there is another body of evidence still to be dissected, one that allows the murder to be analyzed a fraction of a second at a time. Abraham Zapruder's home movie. Testing Zapruder's camera, the FBI learns a crucial detail. The Zapruder film chops time up into eighteenths of a second. So you have snapshots every eighteenth of a second. Investigators will use the film to establish a timeline the majority of witnesses heard three shots. The first bullet evidently missed and has never been found. Most agree the fatal head wound was the third and final shot, Zapruder frame 313. The earliest sign of trouble is at frame 225, when the car emerges from behind the sign. Kennedy has clearly been hit at Zapruder frame 225. Connolly's not showing obvious pain until the 2, 30, 5, 6, 7 range. Rewinding to before the sign, neither man appears hit, so clearly both are shot somewhere between frame 210, when they disappear, and frame 240, a time span of 30 frames. So you've got 30 Zapruder frames. That's all you've got. And you've got two guys to wound. 30 frames is 1.6 seconds. But now, whoops, the FBI tested the rifle. It can't be fired that fast. It can only, you need 2.3 seconds to fire it twice. There's not enough time for a single gunman to fire two shots during that, during that time frame. So if a single gunman could not wound both men during that 30 frame interval, there must have been two shooters, a conspiracy. Then, if that were true, you had a hell of a problem. It was much more convenient to have one man, one lone nut was responsible. To explain how one shooter could wound both men in 1.6 seconds, Arlen Specter, a lawyer for the Warren Commission, concludes Kennedy and Connolly were shot by the same bullet. The single bullet theory an enormous Achilles heel in the whole Warren Commission reconstruction. The theory says a bullet hit Kennedy in the back, exited his throat, went on to hit Connolly, exited the chest, hit Connolly in the wrist, breaking the radius bone, and then buried itself very shallowly in his left thigh. The single bullet theory has traditionally been maybe the single most controversial thing that the Warren Commission came up with. One of the most important people who didn't believe the single bullet theory was Governor Connolly. Connolly and his wife, Nellie, disagree with the timing of the theory. Connolly said, the first bullet hit Kennedy and the second bullet hit me. And his wife, Nellie, said the same thing. In the film, Connolly does appear to react later than Kennedy, as if they were not hit by the same shot. For the single bullet theory to be true, 
Governor Connolly had to be wrong. And Connolly was completely unequivocal. That is not what happened. And Connolly was an experienced hunter. He was a man who knew his way around a gun. Skeptics also point to the condition of the bullet found on Connolly's stretcher. That bullet was almost pristine, and that's what's called the magic bullet. This is the Carcano bullet the Warren Commission said caused seven separate wounds in Kennedy and Connolly. People who see the supposed single bullet will look at it and say, it couldn't possibly have inflicted seven wounds because it ought to be more damaged than that. How on earth can a rifle bullet go through two people and look essentially undamaged? Now, Luke and Mike Haig are conducting experiments using the Carcano rifle to evaluate the single bullet theory. The first experiment is a test of the stability and penetrating power of the Carcano bullet. Could it pass through Kennedy, Conley's torso, then Conley's wrist, and into his thigh? And if so, what condition would it be in? Mike Haig will test fire one round into one of the oldest ballistic test materials. Pine boards. By setting up a group of boards, you can learn a number of things. Does the bullet deflect? Is it going to deviate? And once it deviates, is it now going to snap or break or deform? And then, of course, how deep does it go? They'll use a timing device called a chronograph and Doppler radar to measure the speed of the bullet, the edge of the table. as well as high-speed video. Gun is going hot. Range is hot. Five, four, three, two. Range is safe. Velocity 2,089, 10 feet beyond the muzzle. The instruments show the bullet is traveling just under 2,100 feet per second as it leaves the gun, almost twice the speed of sound. High-speed video, recording 20,000 frames per second, shows the Carcano bullet is perfectly straight and stable as it hits the target. Good. Nice round hole. Okay, we can see our entry hole. The wood's intact. Nothing coming out the backside. Okay. Let's start from the back. Now we've got something in here. You can clearly feel that they're bound together where we've got that stress crack across right, the top. So we're at exactly three feet. The bullet has penetrated 36 inches. But what condition is it in? The nose of this bullet is undeformed. It's still perfectly round. This sort of simple demonstration or experiment shows us a number of things. That this bullet is a very hard, very stable bullet. It's just plowed through three feet of pine boards. These bullets are capable of passing through two human beings. But this test only shows the bullet in one medium, wood. In the single bullet theory, it passes through multiple materials. Kennedy's neck, then air, then Connolly. So the next step is to recreate what happens when a Carcano bullet hits human tissue. It's basically a splash. We're basically a bag of water. If you throw a rock into the water, the water parts. So does muscle tissue to high velocity bullets. To learn how muscle tissue parts when penetrated by a Carcano bullet, they'll use two different tissue simulants, ballistic gelatin and ballistic soap. Both have the same density and resistance to penetration as human muscle. But they behave differently when struck by a bullet. We're looking at a temporary cavity in gelatin that opens up and collapses. But ballistic soap freezes the moment in time, preserving the wound cavity. That temporary cavity is formed by the splash, by the plow of the bullet through it, but it stays there. The pine boards have already shown that a Carcano bullet can easily go straight through two people. But the single bullet theory is all about what it does after it emerges from Kennedy's neck. Does it remain intact? Is it deflected? What happens to its velocity? How fast was it going? That's important to know what kind of damage can we expect it to do to another gunshot victim, such as Conley, or to the car. In these three feet, the space between Kennedy and Connolly 
lie the answers that prove or disprove the single bullet theory. They'll start with the soap. It's very similar to Neutrogena, that clear amber soap that you can see through. This has the same density and the same resistivity to penetration as muscle tissue. I've also put this cloth on here so we can see a phenomenon called bullet wipe. Range is hot. Five, four, three, two, one. Gonna say. First thing to notice is this cloth with the bullet hole in it. The dark ring you see around there is a phenomenon known to forensic scientists as bullet wipe. It's the smudgy material on the surface of a bullet that literally wipes off as it pushes through the first surface it encounters. This is important because it tells you direction. This is an entry. There is bullet wipe around the small round hole in Kennedy's coat. Okay, I've removed the cloth and the skin simulant. Here we have something different. We have a representative of the temporary cavity that the tissue would have been hurled out, propelled out, but in a real person or in tissue or gelatin, it had collapsed back. This is the exit, and we can see it's very little different in size than the entry. Okay, I've sectioned this lengthwise along the, the wound track, and the noticeable things are that it's perfectly straight. But near the exit, the wound path gets wider. Something's happening to the bullet. This is the entrance. The bullet stays stable, 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 nose forward. Over here is the exit, and it's just starting to yaw. Yaw means the bullet is changing its orientation in flight. It's still moving in a straight line, but it's starting to tumble. High-speed video shows the bullet beginning to yaw after it emerges from the soap. Now they try a shot through gelatin. Okay, on target. Five, four, three, two, one. The wound path opens up, then collapses. And just like firing through soap, the bullet goes into yaw. Oh, another yawing, tumbling bullet. It's almost in perfect yaw, maybe at 80 instead of 90. Beyond the target is a witness panel, a piece of quarter-inch sheetrock. It's three feet beyond the soap, the same position Connolly was in three feet beyond Kennedy. The witness panel records the bullet's orientation after exiting Kennedy's neck. We've got an intact bullet. It's not deformed. We can see the profile of it. There's the nose. There's the heel or the base. But it's going sideways. Here's an actual fired Carcano bullet. And we can see it's almost perfectly in profile. Connolly's coat has this kind of a hole in it. And so does Connolly's back, according to his surgeon. In test after test, the Carcano bullet moves straight through tissue simulant, but tumbles when it re-enters the air. Time after time, the instant this bullet is back out into the atmosphere, it goes into yaw. That was a real surprise. I can't explain it, but from a science standpoint, it's repeatable. A bullet hitting sideways has much more resistance, which helps explain Connolly's wounds. It's like holding your hand out the window of a car going 90 miles an hour, so you feel a lot of resistance. If you put your hand like that, you feel very little. So when the bullet hits Connolly, it's now going sideways, and it does a lot of damage. The sideways bullet has a bigger profile and is slowing down. That makes it easy for it to break bones without much damage to itself. And in fact, the stretcher bullet is damaged. If you look at it end on, it's mashed very considerably. It's actually in an oval shape, not round. So it has suffered some damage. And it's exactly the type of damage a bullet would get from hitting sideways. Operating on Connolly's wrist, doctors found bits of lead. Luke Haig thinks the soft lead was squeezed out of the bullet's hard copper jacket like toothpaste from a tube because it was going sideways. A soda can filled with soft plastic illustrates. If I put forces on this this way and keep it straight, it's strong. If I put force on it like this, now it's going sideways, some of the lead gets squeezed out. 
because now the bullet's sideways when it hits hard bone, some of this breaks off. A straight line through JFK's neck, elliptical holes in Connolly's back and coat with no bullet wipe, bits of lead in the wrist, a bullet noticeably flattened with lead bulging out the bottom, and tests showing the Carcano bullet consistently turns sideways. To Luke Haig, the single bullet theory adds up. There's no reason not to conclude that the single bullet theory as proposed by Arlen Specter uh, is the correct one. But there's another Warren conclusion some find hard to accept, that the fatal headshot, the third shot, entered from the rear. It will take 12 years for this controversy to erupt because the public has never seen the Zapruder film in motion until March 1975. This is uh, very heavy. It's the film shot by the Dallas dress manufacturer, Abraham uh, Zapruder. When they're shown the film in motion, viewers are stunned to see the direction Kennedy moves when he's hit in the head. And now, at the bottom of the screen, the head shot. That's the shot that blew off his head. And as you can see, clearly, the head is thrown violently backwards. Kennedy goes backwards like this, back into the left. He's thrown backwards into the left. If he's hit by a bullet from behind, why would his head go in the direction that the shot came from? It seems more likely that he was driven backwards by a bullet from the front. But the Warren Commission had been telling us all along he got hit in the back of the head. That convinced a lot of people there had to be a conspiracy because they assumed he was thrown back into the left by a shot from the right front. If there was a shot from the front, then there were clearly two gunmen and there was some kind of conspiracy. And that tidal wave of public concern and anger, really, eventuated in the formation of the House Select Committee. In 1976, the House Select Committee on Assassinations begins investigating the murders of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Three years later, many of their conclusions agree with the Warren Commission. Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots. The first probably missed. The second hit Kennedy and Connolly. The third, the headshot, killed Kennedy. But there is one major difference, and it's a bombshell. The House Select Committee finds there were two gunmen. There was a conspiracy. The evidence for this startling conclusion is audio recordings from a police motorcycle. Some say the recordings indicate a fourth shot, but they've been controversial from the beginning. Experts disagree about what's on the recordings, and the analysis of them has been roundly criticized. In 1982, the National Academy of Sciences examined the acoustic evidence. They concluded, uh, no, these uh, conclusions are simply invalid. And so the acoustic evidence, while I find it very interesting, I would say it's not decisive. But controversial recordings aside, what did witnesses actually hear? A fair number of witnesses said the shots came from the depository and a fair number from the direction of the grassy knoll. The grassy knoll is a slight rise on the northwest side of Dealey Plaza. If there were a gunman here, that could explain a shot from the right front. But many witnesses simply weren't sure where the shots came from. A number of people, when asked where the shots came from, said there was no way to tell, there's too much reverberation. The Kennedy assassination is just one example of the difficulty of pinpointing gunshots. Locating where shots are coming from is hard for anyone, no, even trained soldiers, especially in urban environments. It's a major problem for our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan to be able to understand where shooters are in these urban environments. Multiple buildings, multiple locations that the shockwaves reverberate off of and give us multiple sound signatures. At New Mexico Tech, yep. West. Professor yeah. Michael Hargather studies shockwaves caused by explosions. Using a special high-speed camera, extremely bright-focused light, and a reflective screen, his team takes pictures of sound. We can literally photograph the invisible, small density differences within the air. What we're going to see here with the Shattergraph system is we're going to see a line that is the shadow cast by that shockwave. Down. 
that line represents the interface between the unshocked ambient air and then what we call the shocked air behind that shock wave. John, you ready? Ready. Camera's ready. Photographing a high-speed rifle bullet reveals two different shock waves. One, V-shaped, is created by the bullet traveling faster than the speed of sound. The other, by the gases that propel it. There's really multiple pieces to this event. The bullet, we can talk about it being supersonic as it exits the gun because it's traveling faster than the speed of sound. And the burning of the gunpowder, that produced what we call a muzzle blast. So with a supersonic rifle bullet like the Carcano, an observer can hear two sounds, the crack of the bullet passing, followed by the blast of the gun that fired it, like so, all bouncing and echoing between the buildings in Dealey Plaza. In a complicated geometry like Dealey Plaza in Dallas, you could get multiple shock reflections in that geometry. And so someone could hear multiple sounds from a single shot. But regardless of what people heard, was a shot from the grassy knoll even possible? To hit Kennedy from the right front, possibly explaining why he moved back and to the left, what trajectory would the bullet have had to take? In 1963, the Warren Commission had to calculate trajectories manually. Today, investigators have a different tool. 3D laser scanning. What the laser scanner does is it spins around and it makes millions and millions of laser measurements that are very, very accurate. And the result is it greatly enhances the data collection process at a crime scene. So I want to do a high-res scan here. On laser scan specialist window. Tony Grissom is working with ballistics expert Mike Haig to create a 3D virtual model of Dealey Plaza. The laser system is going to put a laser up into the mirror system, which directs it at a 90 degree angle over to this enclosed cube. And then when the laser rotates around the scene, you're able to come away with 360 degrees of data. The first step is to scan from multiple points in the plaza, including the sixth floor of the book depository. When I first started in this business, if you went into a typical crime scene, you might walk out having used your tape measure, your roller wheel, and it was inevitable that you would realize later that you missed a measurement. Do we know the camber of the road? Do we know how high the curb was? Did you take it? I didn't take it. Did you? It's all in the computer. We've done a panoramic uh, scan already. Now we're going to do what's called a detailed scan just of the actual window. Processing such a huge amount of data will take weeks. When it's done, all of Dealey Plaza, every building, window, street lamp, and tree exists in a computer, accurate to an eighth of an inch. Mike, could we go and, and take a vantage point looking at the grassy knoll uh, and pick some points and look at distances and trajectory from there to the limousine location where the headshot actually occurred? Sure. The 3D laser scan data allows me to look at any shot I want to, including the grassy knoll shot, shots from the sixth floor, missed shots, anything. It's all about angles and distances. I'm interested in the distance from the knoll to, say, the headshot, and the knoll to the next shot. Mike Haig wants to evaluate a grassy knoll trajectory. Here's the corner of the stockade fence. Maybe right about behind that tree, uh, around in there. Could we also see what the vertical angle would be, the downward angle? So from the top of the stockade fence, for example, to the president's head. Sure. If it came from the knoll, we're looking at about 105 feet. That's correct. Okay. When the distances and angles are all calculated, the answer is clear. So 105 feet, negative four degrees downward if we define horizontal as zero. In the 3D virtual Dealey Plaza, a trajectory from the grassy knoll to Kennedy is possible. The distances are certainly within realm of a typical firearm, but you would have to have had an entrance wound in the front right area of the president's head. Clearly, the right side of Kennedy's head is terribly injured. His skull is shattered. But is this devastating damage an entrance wound? The only way to know for sure would be to examine Kennedy's skull. Since that's impossible, 
a team at the Boston University School of Medicine will instead try to virtually reconstruct Kennedy's head wound. Greg Mahoney is a forensic artist. James McKinnis, a forensic anthropologist. Leading the team is Peter Cummings, a pathologist who specializes in gunshot wounds to the head. What I typically do with a gunshot wound to the head case is I'll try to reconstruct the skull by taking the fragments and putting them back into the place where they belong anatomically. Several fragments of Kennedy's skull were recovered from his scalp, the limousine, and Dealey Plaza. To see if there's any sign of a shot from the grassy knoll, the team tries to piece together the fragments. Cummings hopes that reconstructing the skull will show whether or not there's an entry wound in the right front. When the process is complete, the team sees only evidence of a rear entry wound. Everything I've seen is consistent with a relatively simple scenario. A bullet enters here and comes out roughly in this area. I don't know where the exit wound is. There's not a discrete exit point. But this is only an experiment using publicly available copies of autopsy photos and x-rays. To learn more, Cummings goes to the National Archives where the high-quality originals and Kennedy's clothing are kept. The Kennedy family has granted him access on Nova's behalf, but no cameras are allowed. It was a real honor. It's something that I grew up with. As a boy, seeing the Zabruder film was one of the things that really fueled my interest in doing forensics. This was John F. Kennedy, and I was handling his clothing. Even though I went there for a very specific reason, a scientific reason, certainly th that moment wasn't lost on me. The photographs themselves are, are crystal clear. The sharpness is amazing. You can get a lot of detail from them, much better than anything you can find that's publicly available. Even so, they're not perfect. A photo intended to document the entry point is unclear because for whatever reason, the autopsy doctors did not shave the head wound. The brain yields more information. This is a drawing of President Kennedy's brain that was done for one of the investigative committees. We see the wound track that extends from the occipital pole, the back of the brain, the back tip of the brain, all the way up through the front of the brain. A shot from the grassy knoll would have exited through the left side of Kennedy's brain, but that is largely undamaged. Moving on to an X-ray of Kennedy's skull, multiple fractures are evident. To Cummings, the pattern of fracture lines is a clue to the bullet's direction. As the bullet impacts the skull, the fracture lines will radiate off from that point of impact. As that's happening, the head is also expanding from this incredible pressure wave that's occurring inside the head. In tests at the Biophysics Laboratory, an Army research center, Carcano bullets were fired into human skulls filled with ballistic gelatin. First, the impact of a bullet entering from the rear causes fractures to radiate forward. But almost at the same instant, a pressure wave inside the gelatin causes a second wave of fractures in a perpendicular direction, just like what Cummings sees on the Kennedy X-ray. So you have these long fractures that'll radiate out from an entry wound, and then you have these concentric fractures that happen perpendicular to the original fracture lines. If Kennedy had been shot from the grassy knoll, the primary fracture lines would radiate backwards from the front. But the X-ray shows the opposite. They radiate forward from the rear. Based on this fracture pattern in the skull, I think we can definitively say no, there is no shot from the side or from the front. But there is one lingering mystery. Where exactly was the entry wound? For 50 years, confusion over its precise location has fueled controversy. The autopsy doctors said it was low. The House committee put it four inches higher. One scientist thinks the autopsy doctors were right. Larry Sturdivant is an expert in wound ballistics. He worked at the Army's biophysics lab where the skull tests were done. Sturdivant thinks the House committee assumed there must be a straight line from the bullet's entry to exit in order to line up with the sixth floor window. Probably the reason that they developed the higher impact point was simply to explain the fact that that sort of line could line up with the school book depository window. 
I don't know why they assumed that it had to make a straight path. In the test at the biophysics lab, Carcano bullets did not follow a straight path inside the skull because they were deformed on impact. The bone is hard enough and strong enough and dense enough to deform the bullet. When it destabilizes, it begins to yaw. As soon as it begins to yaw, it develops a lift force, like an airplane wing, and it will inevitably take a curved path. This is consistent with the physical evidence. The bullet that hit Kennedy's head fragmented, leaving pieces in the brain and in the car. Sturdivant thinks the pressure wave created by the bullet inside the brain also explains Kennedy's movement backward. The tissue inside the skull was being moved around. It caused a massive amount of nerve stimulation to go down his spine. Every nerve in his body was stimulated. Now, since the back muscles are stronger than the abdominal muscles, that meant that Kennedy arched dramatically backwards. After 50 years, one of the most witnessed murders in history is still discussed and debated. Science can explain some things. How a relatively intact Carcano bullet could wound two men, and how a shot from behind could cause Kennedy's backward movement. But when it comes to the Kennedy assassination, there are some explanations science cannot provide. History doesn't always make sense. Here's a nothing person who brought down the leader of the free world. In a few seconds, one guy gets off three rounds, changes the course of history forever. No experiments can show why someone would take a rifle to a high window and pull the trigger, but they can show it's probable that Lee Harvey Oswald did, and that his shots alone killed President John F. Kennedy. The essence of good forensic science is to look at what are the competing explanations of an event. And if you can rule out that which is impossible, that which remains, however seemingly improbable, is the truth. This Nova program is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Nova is also available for download on iTunes.